Hello, my name is Dr. Anne Marie Vandersanden. I'm a professor of horticulture at Iowa State University. Welcome to the online garden design course. The module I'll be presenting is titled Garden Design History Context for Architecture, Culture, and Human Needs. In this presentation, I will discuss two framing concepts that can be used to provide appropriate context for garden design history. I will also discuss the historical role of landscapes in society and provide an overview of key areas in Western civilization history and their impact on landscape design. I will provide a similar overview of eras within Eastern civilization history and their impact on landscape design in a separate module. Because of the time constraints on this online course, I will just highlight some of the key features or elements that characterize gardens from these different eras with the intent that you will then be able to recognize these design characteristics in contemporary designs. Landscapes and gardens created and manipulated by humankind reflect responses to both a site and human needs. Climate, time and history, societal or religious circumstances, and political systems all played a role in landscape development and use. These framing concepts will be the basis for the different eras and the associated design features that I will describe in the following series of slides. Designed and built landscapes have long played an important role in society. Some of the most important roles include being a place that reflects nature, climate, landform, culture, and spirituality. They are also places where people live and where quality of life is improved. Landscapes are used by the general public and society as a whole. Landscapes are also places where scientific and technological advances occur. And finally, landscapes are places where ideas can be borrowed from. The stone formations at Stonehenge are just one example of a remnant from an ancient landscape. The formation reflects much of the nature, climate, landform, culture, and spirituality of that time. If you aren't able to travel to Wiltshire, England, image on the left, you should consider a trip to Alliance, Nebraska to take in Carhenge, a Midwestern version of Stonehenge, image on the right. I've not seen it yet, but it is on my bucket list. Historical gardens show that the gardens of ancient Egypt occurred between 2000 and 1000 BC. And this is one of the first cultures to develop the formal garden in the Western world. The architecture of the time, the relatively flat topography, and the hot, dry climate in that area significantly influenced these gardens. The control and conservation of water is one of Egypt's most valuable contributions to gardening. Some of the features that make these gardens unique are that they were walled gardens. Archaeologists have discovered in the ancient tombs drawings, paintings, and remnants of the garden art created by the Egyptians which is some of the earliest documented. The gardens had an axial layout with mirror symmetry. This layout was accentuated with long rows of trees on either side of the axis to create an LA. Plants were selected to serve specific purposes, including to provide a food source, to be used for medicinal needs, to be ornamental, or because they related to a spirituality of the time. Because of the hot, dry climate, water often played a central theme in Egyptian gardens and was used in canals, basins, or as part of sacred water motifs. The image on the right is an ancient line drawing of an Egyptian garden. The garden includes a square of land surrounded by walls and plants, number one, a dwelling house carefully hidden away shaded by trees and near water elements, number two, and the vineyard in the middle, number three. All the trees are grouped into rows throughout the design.
The gardens of ancient Greece occurred between 900 and 500 BC. Just as with the Egyptian gardens, the climate and landform of Greece significantly impacted the gardens of that time. The mountainous terrain and little rain influenced garden layout as well as plant selection. The societal structure of the time resulted in few grand buildings or gardens compared to ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. The societal structure also resulted in creating large public garden spaces for gatherings. The Greeks contributed a number of advances in agriculture and technology, including an initial plant nomenclature system, plant collections for study, and a resulting understanding of plants that could be used for medicinal purposes. Greek mythology was evidenced in the large sacred groves of trees where gods resided. The gardens of ancient Rome occurred between 700 BC and 500 AD. The Romans of this time period are believed to have been the greatest builders in history, and their buildings were spread across Europe, Asia, and Africa. The widespread size of the Roman Empire ultimately influenced the highly developed garden culture of the time, and Roman aristocrats had the first gardens solely for pleasure. These ancient Roman gardens were very similar to the gardens of ancient Egypt. The gardens had a formal and axial design. They also included numerous water features used as basins or fountains. Garden art also played a prominent role in Roman gardens, which included wall paintings, pergolas, benches, sculpture, and mosaic pavings. We also have the Romans to thank for the creation and popularization of topiary. The image on this slide is of the landscape at the Getty Museum in California. It is promoted as an outstanding replica of an ancient Roman garden. The axial layout and sheared plant forms, or topiaries, are evident. Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD and preserved quite a bit of Pompeii's gardens. The image on the left is a painting from that time, uncovered by archaeologists. The image on the right is a reconstructed courtyard space that would have been prevalent in gardens of this time period. It shows a basin for water in the middle and a number of sculpture elements. After the fall of the last Roman emperor in 476 AD, the world moved into the Dark Ages, which occurred from 500 to 1300 AD. After the decline of Rome, there is little mention of gardens, except for what was recorded by monks at monasteries. These records show that gardens served utilitarian functions, such as food and medicine. They were mainly monastery and cloister gardens and were enclosed to form a courtyard. Water as a sustenance of life was the center point, and some plants were included because of symbolism such as a red rose to represent Christ's blood and a white lily to represent the Virgin Mary. The image on this slide shows a modern day visitor contemplating what might have occurred in this courtyard garden. The image on this slide is from the cloister garden at the Utrecht Cathedral in Utrecht, the Netherlands. The Gothic cathedral was built over a number of years, but is believed to have been completed around 1254. It provides a good example of an enclosed garden with utilitarian plantings and water at the center of the design, which was common during the Dark Ages. The gardens of the Middle Ages occurred between 1300 and 1400. These gardens still had an inward focus, but as the Middle Ages progressed, the gardens became larger in size compared to those of the Dark Ages. Also, during the Middle Ages, new garden practices and technologies were documented. The image on the right of this slide shows one of the earliest drawings of the precursor to the modern day wheelbarrow. Additional examples of the new gardening practices that became popular during the Middle Ages were pleaching, 
and espalier. They are similar in concept. Pleaching results in a three-dimensional plant sculpture, while the practice of espaliering creates a two-dimensional plant form, usually trained onto a fixed structure, such as a wall or a fence. The Italian Renaissance occurred between 1500 and 1600. Gardens during this time were designed to illustrate the Renaissance ideals of measure and proportion and were truly a living art form. These gardens were characterized by a formal and axial layout that blended and connected the building and the garden. The gardens included extensive collections of sculpture and fountains and intricate planting patterns called parterres. The hilly topography found in much of Italy also meant that the gardens included a number of level terraces in order to create a large planting space. The top image on this slide shows how the topography influenced the garden design, as well as the overall axial layout of the space. The bottom image is of parterres inside of a walled garden. The French Renaissance occurred from 1600 to 1700. Gardens during this time continued in the Baroque style and were similar to the gardens of the Italian Renaissance. The gardens had a formal and axial design, included a lot of sculpture, either made from stone and plants, such as topiaries. French Renaissance gardens also included extensive use of water features that included water that was still or moving. And finally, the building on the property was still found at the center of the garden. This painting of Versailles in France, in France, in France, shows an axial and formal layout of this grand estate. The arrow in the middle points to the main entrance gate into the palace courtyard. This picture from 2015 shows the entrance gate still standing. Sculpture of both plants and from stone were used extensively in Versailles. The image on the left is a line drawing from a garden journal of one of the early gardeners of Versailles. The red arrow on the image on the right shows that same topiary form in the garden in 2015. The topiary collection at Versailles is truly spectacular. The English garden design style really started to evolve in the 16 to 1700s. Initially, the designs re resembled the French Renaissance style, which included axial layout and sheared plant material. The top image shows that style. However, by the late 1700s, the gardens began to change and more natural influences were evidenced. The designs looked to be more in harmony with nature and were not as formal looking. The bottom, illustri bottom image illustrates this more naturalistic look. Although the gardens look natural, they were still just as designed and created as earlier gardens that really looked like they had been designed. Charles Bridgman, William Kent, and Lancelot Capability Brown were influential designers during this time, and they developed, refined, and promoted the concept of English naturalism. The notable gardens of this time were found at the country estates of wealthy Englishmen. The gardens were very large and often included grazing cattle and sheep. They utilized existing topography and included numerous views within the landscape as a person moved through the expansive area. To enhance and frame these views, the gardens included large rolling lawns, large sculpted lakes that looked natural but were man-made, and large clumps of trees. All of these elements are seen in the bottom image on this slide. As a side note, the lawnmower was invented in England in 1830. Many gardens also had a resident hermit who lived on the grounds to delight visitors, although they could not speak to the visitors. 
and gardens with grazing animals had strategically situated ha-has to keep the animals from getting too close to the manor house. The top image shows a large lawn area adjacent to the house, and there likely would have been a ha-ha located down the hill somewhere to keep the sheep from getting too close. This brings me to the conclusion of this presentation on garden design, history, context for architecture, culture, and human needs. In summary, this presentation has highlighted how humankind has long manipulated their living environment to meet their needs. I've done this by describing how different cultures have impacted landscape design through a whirlwind tour of key historical eras. Climate, time and history, societal and religious circumstances, and political systems all played a role in landscape development and use. There is substantial evidence, both anecdotal and research-based, that plants and natural and built landscapes play an important role in our lives. I encourage you to explore this topic in more detail. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on garden design history as part of the Iowa State University Department of Horticulture online garden design course.